Hello and welcome. Today we will be going over forces and Newton's laws of motion. First we're going to talk about the causes of motion. Then we will be defining a force as well as looking at the two types of forces. Then we will go over the eight catalog forces. Finally, we'll review Newton's laws of motion and do some practice problems there. In our day-to-day -day lives, we see motion all around us, but what actually causes it? Well, motion occurs when an unbalanced force acts on an object. Objects at rest have balanced forces acting on them, with a net force of zero. The only situation in which objects have no force acting on them is when they are at rest in space, far away from gravitational forces. Another thing to keep in mind is that objects won't stop moving until acted on by an equal opposing force. In the real world, objects usually stop moving due to friction. In short, unbalanced forces cause motion and objects in motion stay at a constant velocity until another force acts on it. We'll go into further detail when we look into Newton's first law. Now that we know that forces cause motion, the next question for us to answer is, what is a force? Well, a force can best be described as a push or a pull where different agents are interacting. Forces are vector quantities, which means that they have a magnitude and a direction. Forces need an object to be considered a force, otherwise they would not exist. An example of a force would be a box being pushed with a 5 newton force to the right. 5 newtons is the magnitude of the force, and right is the direction. Now that we know what forces are, we need to know that we can classify them into two main categories, contact forces and long range forces. Contact forces will always have a point of contact where the agent of the force touches the object. Hitting a punching bag and throwing a basketball in the air are both contact forces in which an object interacts with a physical agent. Long range forces, on the other hand, act on the object without physically touching it. Examples of this could be a magnet attracting iron nails or the gravity of the earth pulling an apple to the ground. Now we will be looking at the different types of forces. The first force we will cover is gravity. The discovery of gravity was made by Sir Isaac Newton. Gravity is a force that pulls objects with the mass together. The mass of an object correlates directly with its gravitational pull, which is why objects near the Earth are pulled towards the surface. Earth is large enough to have a visible gravitational pull, which allows us to stay on the ground. This pull is what causes objects to drop. Gravity is a long range force, and the term weight describes the force that gravity exerts on the mass of an object. For this reason, you would weigh six times less on the moon than you do on Earth. Next up is tension force, which can be observed when a rope pulls on an object. What you need to know is that pulling on the string stretches the molecular bonds creating a tension that stiffens the string and allows it to exert a force. Tension force cannot push objects because this would not tighten the molecular bonds and the string would just sag. Tension is a contact force. Normal force is a common force that we can observe when a surface pushes back on an object that interacts with it. In this example of the book on the table, the normal force matches the force of gravity. The book pushes on the molecular structure of the table, and the molecules want to maintain their distance, so they push back against the book. The normal force always wants to balance the force acting on it, so it exerts a perpendicular and equal force on the object. Normal force is a contact force. Kinetic friction, also known as dynamic friction, is present when an object is sliding across the surface. Kinetic friction always acts against the object in motion, slowing the object down until it is at rest. Kinetic friction is due to the molecular irregularities between the surface of two objects, which bump against each other to resist motion. For this reason, a hockey puck sliding over smooth ice will have relatively low kinetic friction. Rough surfaces will cause more kinetic friction. Kinetic friction is a contact force. Static friction, on the other hand, keeps an object from moving. 
Objects can stay still on slanted surfaces because the static friction balances the force that would otherwise cause the motion. One important thing to keep in mind with de when dealing with static friction is that it only matters if the two objects are stationary relative to each other. When a car drives down the street, there is static friction between the wheel surface and the road, which are stationary relative to each other. If the car were to be sliding, say in an icy road condition, there would be kinetic friction present. Without static friction, the car would slide down the road. Another important thing to note is that static and kinetic friction cannot act on an object at the same time. Static friction is a contact force. We can easily identify spring force when we ask ourselves this question. Is the object moving back into its natural shape? If so, then the spring force restores an exerted force by moving back into its natural form. Unlike tension force, spring force can either be a push or a pull. Spring force is a contact force. Drag is a resistive force, just like static and kinetic friction. Drag can be experienced by an object when the object is moving through a fluid. Air resistance is a common example of drag, and we see it when a paper tumbles down in the air. Without drag, the paper would fall straight down. Air resistance always acts against motion. Drag is a contact force because the object physically interacts with the fluid. One key note is that drag is also seen in liquids, and we ignore air resistance unless told to do otherwise. Thrust is a contact force that is caused by gas molecules expelled at high speeds. Rockets are a prime example of thrust, and they push mass in one direction to move in the opposite direction. When an object expels mass in one direction, an opposite perpendicular force is created. This force is what's known as thrust. Kinetic forces are both long-range forces, which work on an atomic level. The difference is that electric forces are interactions between two electric charges, which can either be attractive or repulsive to each other. Magnetic forces, on the other hand, only act on moving charged particles, while electric forces can act on all charged particles. We have already established that forces cause motion, but what happens when a force constantly acts on an object versus when a force only initially acts on an object? Constant forces cause objects to accelerate. Objects with a constant force will have a constant acceleration. If a rocket was in a vacuum, the initial force would cause it to move at a constant velocity. On the contrary, if the rocket had its thrusters on, the force would be constant, and the rocket would constantly accelerate to higher speeds as long as the force was acting on the rocket. The ability of objects to resist change in velocity is called inertia, and inertia can be overcome through unbalanced forces. Now we're going to look at Newton's laws of motion. Newton's first law states that an object in motion will stay in motion, while an object at rest will stay at rest, unless acted upon by an unbalanced force. What this means is that if an object is not moving, all the forces acting on it are balanced. If the object were at rest in a vacuum with no gravitational forces, then the object would have no forces acting on it. If an object is in motion, then it will remain in motion until another force changes its motion. Newton's second law explains that acceleration and mass are inversely proportional because force is equal to mass times the acceleration. In other words, acceleration is equivalent to the force divided by mass. This is why objects with less mass, such as a shopping cart, will be much easier to accelerate than objects with more mass, such as a car. More mass means more force needed to accelerate. All right, so now that we have our understanding, we're going to start working on some practice problems. So the first problem says a cart has a mass of 30 kilograms. How much force? So they're asking for force. That's the first important thing. How much force would be needed to accelerate the cart at a rate of 2 meters per second squared? So we already have our mass and we have our acceleration. And we know that our formula is force is equal to mass times acceleration. 
The first step would be to write our formula. And then the second step would be to restructure our formula so that we can have the variable we're looking for isolated. In this case, that's already done for us because we're looking for force. So force is equal to mass times acceleration. The next thing we're going to do is substitute our units, our substitute our variables. So our mass is 30 kilograms and our acceleration is two meters per second squared. So now that we have our variables, we're just going to multiply 30 and 2 to get 60. And now our units, it looks like this. Kilograms, me, kilograms per meters per second squared. I'm sorry, kilograms times meters per second squared. And this is actually just going to be equal to newtons. So our final answer will come out to be 60, force is equal to 60 newtons. Now for this question, it's going to be the exact same steps. We're just looking, it looks like in this question, we're looking for the elephant's mass. So since we're looking for the elephant's mass, after writing force is equal to mass times acceleration, we're going to have to restructure the formula to look for mass. So we do this by dividing both sides by acceleration, and we get mass is equal to force divided by acceleration. Now the next thing we're going to do is just substitute our variables, just like we did in the question before. And I know this looks complicated, but that's just because of the units over here. But what you'll actually notice is that meters per second squared is going to cancel out on the top and bottom. So we're left with 7,680 kilograms divided by 2.56. And when we actually do the math on this, we get mass is equal to 3,000 kilograms, which is pretty accurate for an elephant. Now we're going to work through one more practice question. And it's going to be the exact same steps. So first we're going to write down force is equal to mass times acceleration. And then we have to, we're looking for acceleration because it says right here, what is the acceleration? And to, to find acceleration, we have to restructure our equation. So we multiply both, we divide both sides by mass and we get acceleration is equal to force divided by mass. Now we're going to substitute our variables and the force is 12.48. Let me change the color there. The force is 12.48 newtons and the mass is 0.624 kilograms. And we know that newtons is equal to kilograms times meter per second squared. So and on the bottom, we have our mass in also in kilograms. So what we can do here is we can cancel out. We can cancel out kilograms, which is just going to leave us meters per second squared. And 12.48 divided by 0 0.624 is going to equal 20. So our acceleration is equal to 20 meters per second squared. Newton's third and final law of motion explains that when an object exerts a force onto another object, they exert an equal and opposite force on each other. In the example above, the hammer is acting on the nail, but the nail is also acting on the hammer. Although the masses might be different, the force that acts on interacting objects are equal, because the acceleration is equal to mass divided by force. Much heavier objects will see less acceleration, even though the two objects have the same amount of force. And that concludes the presentation. I hope you're able to learn something from it. Thank you for your time, and goodbye for now. See ya.